So this morning I'm talking about um, Charcot arthropathy, um, only of the foot and ankle. Uh, so Charcot arthropathy. Um, in 1703, William Musgrave um, described the neuropathic joint as an arthralgia, and then uh, in 1868, Jean-Martin Charcot um, gave the first detailed description of this disease, and it's a picture of him there. Um, there's many different definitions of Charcot arthropathy, but it's a progressive condition um, of the MSK. It's characterised by joint dislocations, pathological fractures and debilitating deformities, most commonly in the lower extremity. Uh, this is an artist impression, I suppose, of um, Jean-Martin Charcot here with Babinski, his um, a comp his, um, um, trainee, I suppose, at that stage, um, Tourette. Uh, he's actually a neurologist um, in, the, in the French time, and um, this is a picture of him talking about, um, so to speak, mad women at the stage. Um, and uh, there's other interesting names there. There is another Chateau, yeah. Um, Jean Baptiste. Well, there's actually a few. There's Jean Baptiste, which is um, there, but there's another one as well. So just the background of Charcot, um, predisposing conditions. It was originally thought to be tabies or syphilis, tertiary syphilis that causes um, Charcot. And that went on for many, many, many years, including Charcot's description. Um, but the predisposing conditions is diabetes, um, alcoholism, syringomyelitis, and spinal cord lesion. And there's some other some minor ones as well associated with it. But today in our, in our society, diabetes is the most common um, um, predisposing condition. Uh, there's been some studies to show that diabetes, if you're a type 1 diabetic, um, you need to be uh, have diabetes for, 10 to, for tw around 20 years um, to actually develop uh, Charcot. However, for type 2 diabetics, you only need to be um, a type 2 diabetic diagnosed anyway for around about 5 to 7 years, depending on which paper you read. So it's a shorter um, experience. And that's maybe because they're not picked up earlier on. Um, generally, there's poor glycemic control associated with these patients. And um, the reported incidence varies from anywhere between half a percent up to 16% of diabetics will have a sharp arthropathy of some, some description. Um, in terms of hallmarks, radiograph radiographic is um, the hallmarks of bony obstruction, fragmentation, bony remodeling, and joint destruction, subluxation, and dislocation. Um, we've got a few actually coming in the clinic soon. Um, so the pathogenesis, it, it's not really determined what causes Charcot arthropathy. Uh, there's two theories. One's a neurotraumatic theory and the other is a neurovascular theory. Um, the neurotraumatic theory is um, that Charcot results from repetitive mechanical trauma from weight bearing on an insensate or partially insensate extremity. Um, and this trauma can lead to intracapsular effusions, ligamentous laxity and joint instability. And because they have an absence of their protective sensation, uh, they have continued loading of this patient extremity, which further perpetuates the cycle. Then there's the other neurovascular theory, which is um, that there's increased peripheral blood flow resulting from an autonomic sympathectomy for some unknown cause. Um, and that autonomic sympathetic sympathectomy produces a failure of the normal regulatory mechanism that control blood flow, and eventually lead to increasing or a dysfunction in the AV shunting vasodilatation. And if you have more blood flow, you have um, increased osteoclastic activity and osteoclasts in the, in the body absorb bone and therefore they demineralize the bone and make it more susceptible to subluxation, pressure and collapse, which is what we see. Um, the, most people believe that it's actually a combination of the two that causes Charcot um, and a combination of osteopenia, bone hyperemia, joint instability, the um, sensory motor deficits all predispose the changes that we see with Charcot. So clinic, clinically, uh, some people describe it as an acute Charcot or a, or a chronic Charcot, um, but I'll go into that. A acute, acute Charcot, first presentation is a warm, hot, swollen, um, I'm talking about the foot here, hot, swollen foot and ankle area. Um, on average, it's 3.3 3 degrees centigrade warmer than the contralateral limb. Um, and they're, because it's warm, hot and swollen, they're often misdiagnosed as cellulitis, osteomyelitis, 
or a gouty or septic arthritis. Um, and there are some clinical tests you can do, such as to a, check the dependent root ball, um, just to determine if it's an osteomyelitis picture versus, or cellulitis picture versus um, uh, shark uh, And then there's, usually there's a sensory neuropathy, but the patients still complain of pain if you ask them, and it's usually a deep-seated um, ache, more so than a sharp pain that some people get. Um, and as with most things that are difficult to, uh, to treat, the diagnosis is by exclusion. Um, and it's usually a clinical diagnosis initially. Um, the examinations that you can find on, at the initial phase can often be normal. Uh, and then a chronic charco is someone who's presented after they've popped that hot swollen phase, and they can have um, painless, um, a deformed foot and ankle, which is actually no temperature difference between the two sides. Uh, but they can have exacerbations of their, their chronic uh, charco. And these patients are at high risk of ulceration and amputation, so long-term follow-up is, is recommended for all Charcot's arthropathic patients. Um, the investigations, the, I, I tried to find CRP and ESR, and if, if a CRP and ESR is useful to, to differentiate between uh, infection, osteomyelitis, and Charcot arthropathy, and I couldn't find anything. I, could, I couldn't say to you that you know, CRP or 70 is more indicative of an infection versus, um, you can have raised CRPs and raised ATSR set rates um, with both conditions, so that's not really um, useful. I mean, it's still worthwhile doing as a monitoring, but um, not useful to um, differentiate. Uh, the X-ray. So the X-ray is our hallmark. Um, often in the early early um, situation, Sharpo, there's an absence or subtle findings, um, and then the late there can be bone and joint destruction, fragmentation. So we'll, I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. Then people do talk about bone scans, nuclear medicine scans. Um, Technician 99 is our standard bone scan. Uh, it shows an increased bone uptake. Um, but then if you compare, if you combine that, 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 that by itself is, a, is a, quite a non-specific and a non-sensitive non uh, test for Charcot. Um, but if you combine it with a white cell label scan such as Indium 111, and you combine the two scans together, you do increase your sensitivity to 93% and specifically 80%. Again, still not great numbers, but um, people can use it. And I'm not sure if we can do Indian scans in Melbourne, uh, which is interesting. Uh, MRI. People talk about now getting an MRI for all the, the uh, Charcot feet. The MRI is, will show bone edema, um, and it may not differentiate between Charcot, osteomyelitis, or other inflammatory conditions. Um, but what it, what it may show you, which may change your treatment, um, plan is the formation of abscesses um, that remain in surgical providers. Eichenholz um, <coughs> is a doctor who uh, does classification system, and his classification system is what you'll need to know for your exams. Um, it is, it's a one, two, and three, but then there's been a, a zero modified Eichenholz stage added to it. Um, Zero is a loss of protective sensation, swelling and erythema in the patient's foot, but a normal x-ray. Now these pictures may not um, come up big enough. That is zero, that is one, that is two, and that is three. Zero is normal foot, effectively. And at that stage, if you've got a suspicion that this is a, um, a Charcot foot, then your recommendation is to protect their weight bearing, uh, do some serial x-rays and just follow them up closely. Make sure their glycemic control, um, hyperglycemia is under control. <coughs> um, this, the, the next stage, or the true stage of uh, first stage of Eichenholz, is the fragmentation or the hot swollen stage. And that's when the foot presents with a, literally a hot swollen foot and ankle. Um, they have dependent rubor. The skin integrity is query compromised. Um, and the x ray can show osteopenia, it can show periarticular fragmentation, frank uh, subluxation and dislocations of. of um, joints within the foot, um, and the treatment then is non weight bearing in a um, total contact cast. Uh, and that total contact cast is often changed weekly until the swelling and temperature comes down. And then, um, once the swelling has come down, we can then move on to the next stage. Um, and we can follow that with serial x rays as well. And that, that period of time, fragmentation can take quite a while, um, months even. So it's, uh, you, you have to develop a very good bond with your um, plastic technician or, or orthotist, but also with the patient and 
place for families. It's a very demanding time for them. Imagine. Um, the second stage is the coalescent stage. Um, people have different names for this, but this is the easiest one that I remember. Coalescence is the early healing, the resolution of the warmth, the erythema and the swelling. This is sort of the cooling down period. Um, in this stage, you can put them in either a bivalve AFO um, or a CRO, which is a, a um, Charcot Restraint Orthotic Walker, uh, which is a customised um, um, uh, um, orthotic. Or orthotic. Um, it's, uh, they're bivalved, they're copolymer, they have a full foot enclosure uh, with a rocker bottom sole, and they, um, or they're fully lined with a custom foot insert um, to the impression of the patient's affected limb, because often these patients don't have a normal looking foot, so they have to be custom made. And we usually wait until the swelling has come down because these have to be custom fit and they're, um, they're not uh, cheap at all. Uh, the third stage is the resolution or the consolidation stage, and this is the foot is cold, it's not hot, um, and uh, it's not painful or swollen, and it's quite stable. However, there's often deformity associated with it. Um, that's the bottom image on the right. Um, and essentially, if it's a plantar grade foot, you can just um, put them in a total contact cast and eventually get them into an accommodative shoe with a wide um, toe box. Um, however, if there's significant deformity and that deformity is causing pressure areas on skin, then surgical debridement or um, intervention is often required. So um, most of this information is from a, a 2010 JALS article, um, which is uh, okay to read by. Um, and they've got this nice table here, which basically breaks down the, the stages the findings you find and then your treatment modalities that you are uh, recommended at that stage. Um, the other thing to talk about, along with the Charcot classification, which is the clinical stages that they're at, there's also the Brodsky's classification of where the Charcot arthropathy is actually occurring in the foot and ankle complex. Um, the majority of it occurs in the tarsal metatarsal joint 60% of the time. Um, and you can get exostosis, ulceration, and rocker bottom deformities at that stage. Um, the 10% occurs in the subtalar and shofar joints, um, and these are actually are more difficult to treat. They're unstable, um, often require a longer immobilization up to two years. Um, and then 3A and 3B are added in there, around the make up the remainder, which is um, at the tibio tibiotalar um, joint, which is, you can get various valgus deformity, and they give you ulcerations over the malleoli areas. Um, and then uh, fractured posterior calcaneum is the 3B, which I've covered every time. Uh, so there's a schematic diagram of the different types. So type 1 is the most common in the TMT joint, followed by 2 and 3 and 3. So there's a classic, classic example of the, probably um, the hot swollen fragmentation phase of type 1, Charcot pres presenting. Uh, the next topic is, um, it's a pretty ugly picture, but um, as you can see, um, these patients are very prone to ulceration. Um, they're diabetic, they often have peripheral vascular disease associated with the diabetes, um, but they also have these ulcers, and the ulcers are typically not only um, vascular related because of their disease, their peripheral vascular disease, but also because of the exostosis that occurs in the deformed foot. Um, and so the usual treatment for this is to debride um, if they're deep, um, or put the and or put them in the total contact cast until the swelling and the ulcer heals itself. That's the usual treatment. Um, Wagner has a classification system which you also may need to know uh, for ulceration, and it's grade zero to five. Um, zero is foot at risk, so it's usually a diabetic patient who you're, you're concerned about. Um, one is superficial ulcer, deep, two is deep ulcer, um, three is an abscess, and four is limited gangrene or forefoot gangrene, and five is the whole foot gangrene. Um, and it often comes up in short answer questions. Now, Brodsky's also got a classification for ulcers, but I, but I found more difficult to learn. Um, in, in essence, treatment treatment is mainly non-operative. Um, it's uh, bracing and medical management. The operative management is mainly required for the residual deformity and the exostosis that may occur. Um, and Usually the plan is to try and get them back to protected weight bearing and put them back into a shoe at some <coughs> stage. Um, and those different braces that you can use and orthotics, uh, the, the crow that I mentioned, but also patellar tendon bearing braces, um, custom mole shoes, etc. 
So I was going to go into total contact cast, but I think I ran out of time. But effectively, a total contact cast is it's designed to spread the load uniformly along the foot and ankle complex, not to have a weight-bearing area in the ball of the foot and the heel of the foot. Um, so it's minimal padding, except over the protuberances. Um, the idea is you spread the load. And it, it needs to be done by someone who actually knows what they're doing, because you can, um, these patients are at risk of uh, um, ulceration. So if you're putting pressure areas in the wrong places, uh, you'll have a disaster on your hands. Um, Tell tendon bearing brace. I've never seen one in, in practice, but um, they're well described as another way to uh, transfer the weight bearing portion through to the patella tendon um, and offload the foot and ankle region. Bisphosphonate. So, <coughs> medical management really now is maintaining glycemic control um, and then the, the supplementation or aid of uh, bisphosphonates. Now, pharmacologically, bisphosphonates are a pyrophosphate analogue um, and effectively they inhibit osteoclastic bone resorption. So by close, stopping the osteoclast, you stop the resorption of bone, and therefore then reduce um, destruction. And there's a whole myriad of uh, uh, bisphosphonates on the market now. And formiginate is probably the most studied. Um, and I'll cut to the chase, but effectively there's a few studies, and they're probably in the late 90s and early 2003, 4. Um, and they show that if you give bisphosphonates, um, you can actually uh, reduce the temperature in some studies of the, compared to the other foot. You can reduce the inflammatory period compared to the other foot if, the, if it's a bilateral arm, Charcot foot. And they say that there is clinical improvement. And a lot of these studies are a bit biased because they're all sponsored by the companies. Um, so it's a bit hard to interpret the information. But there's, I did, I, out of about six studies that I looked uh, click through, there's only one that actually said that it didn't work. Um, so I think at this stage, um, this phosphonate is probably still our main medical treatment. Um, June 2000 did a double blind randomised controlled placebo study. And uh, this is a pretty simple study. He had 40 patients and he just gave formidronate or a saline placebo. And um, he measured ALP, alkaline phosphatase, and um, skin temperature. And he, and he found that the formidronate group had statistically um, significant decrease in skin temps and ALP. So he concluded that uh, even a single dose of formidronate can, um, well, it can reduce bone turnover, but I don't know if it reduces disease activity. But that's what he concluded. Uh, so in essence, surgery. Surgery is, um, the aim of surgery is to provide a stable, painless, plantar grade foot that can be appropriately protected and accommodate footwear and to get the patient mobile again. Um, we often avoid surgery in the early inflammatory phases. However, some advocates out there actually say to go in during that st um, stage one when it's all angry and hot and swollen. Um, I haven't seen that in practice. Um, and the indications for surgery really are recurrent ulcers that are refractory to casting, um, infection abscess, uh, marked instability, um, fixed unbraceable deformity that you'll need to do a corrective osteotomy, um, and that's the same thing for accommodative footwear. Um, Exostectomy is a simple procedure in, in a lot of times. Um, make sure you consider a tendo Achilles when cleaning if there's an equine that's associated with a forefoot ulcer, otherwise your ulcer will not go away. Um, and then the corrective arthrodesis, um, if you're going to fix or fuse, you, you fix long and fuse short, um, and it's just to, to aid your mechanics of the foot. Um, and amputation's high, it is, it is higher, amputation rates are higher by about 20% in the Charcot arthropathy patients compared to diabetes patients with a diabetic ulcer. Um, so it is a significant thing that you'll need to discuss with your patient. Um, and then in conclusion, it's, uh, it is quite a devastating sequelae of diabetes mellitus um, and uh, treatment often requires a initial management and long-term follow-up. But the big thing is it's the multidisciplinary team approach. Um, you've got to involve your, your medical um, counterparts um, and education, education, education to the patient. Um, and then there are the majority is managed non-operatively with some um, surgical interventions required.